Chicago police believe a suspect sought for allegedly plotting to blow up the Chicago police station is now the victim of a murder. Investigators have tentatively identified Angelo Roberts as the man found with his throat slit. The partially frozen body of Four Corner Hustlers Chief, Angelo Roberts, was found by the Chicago Police Department in the trunk of a car on a cold January night in 1995, after he ordered the killing of his gang's founder and his son's grandfather, Walter King Wheat. Angelo's throat was slit, and he was shot five times with five different guns. Angelo Chief Low Roberts continued the gang's history of warring with the police and each other for the love of drug money. By 1995, King Wheat's 1968 order prohibiting members from selling drugs was long forgotten, and the Four Corner Hustlers followed another co-founder, Monroe Money Banks, down a path of death, drugs, and self-destruction. Ray Longstreet assumed the title of Five Star Universal, Chief Elite of the main faction of Fours. His set is known as the Almighty Ray Ray Makative for Corner Hustlers. Sean Betts, a.k.a. Shaky Sean, founded the Body Snatchers set of fours, ran the set as chief, and is the only member Ray Longstreet blessed with the rank of Prince. But there are a lot of other factions of fours with their own chiefs who have supreme authority to form their own councils and appoint members to positions of power to run their gang. For instance, one of Monroe Bank's lieutenants, Morris Liddell Carr, a.k.a. Hodari Joe, acted as chief of the almighty Angelo Maniac for Corner Hustlers, which was formed to honor Angelo Roberts. Later in the year 1995, Ray Longstreet was arrested on weapons charges and sentenced to six years in jail. With Ray Ray in jail, Charles Thornton, a.k.a. Lil Charles, was running the Gordy Boy faction of fours on his behalf in place of his older brother, Gordon Thornton, a.k.a. Gordy. At this time in 1995, according to the Chicago Sun-Times, during the Four Corner Hustlers RICO trial, LeBar Broman Span said he spent about a year on the run from the police, living in Ohio and Indiana, before returning to Chicago around the end of 1996. He then wound up going to prison, walking free on March 16, 1998. He said he joined the Four Corner Hustlers around the age of 13 and later ran errands for the gang as a shorty. After he survived his first shooting, he said he decided to carry a gun wherever he went. Later, he said he began working security for the gang, which his attorney said was involved in a dangerous game. Right, Span said, and I got a gun. In 1996, Bro Man was 18 years old when he was working security for Lil Charles and the Gordy Boys. In 1997, Bro Man renounced his rank as a five-star universal elite four-corner hustler and claimed the title of chief of an outlaw set of four-corner hustlers known as the Syndicate. During this time, Bro Man was introduced to a five-star universal elite unknown vice lord named Mario Young. By 1997, Mario Young controlled the drug trade at the corner of Maple and Kilpatrick. He also supplied wholesale quantities of illegal narcotics to the other various gangs in his neighborhood including the Four Corner Hustlers and Lil Charles. By 2013, Rio the Rat had made hundreds of recordings for the police of Bro Man and dozens of other gangsters talking gangster shit on a wiretap. The man admitted on the stand that he snitched on so many people from 2003 to 2013 that he couldn't remember all of them, but let's not jump that far ahead just yet. You can learn more about Rio the Rat in our video SNITCH. Now, let's go back to the year 1997 and hear the story of when Bro Man met Rio the Rat. Can you describe the first meeting that you had with Mr. Span? He was with Charles. Me and Charles had to meet, and he was with Charles on Charles' security, him and a couple of other guys. So, Mr. Span was with Charles, and you were having a meeting with Charles? Yes. And Mr. Span was security for Mr. Charles? Yes. Did he bring other people with him? Yes. Do you remember who he brought with him? I remember a couple of the guys, yes. Who did he bring with him? He brought Spiffy, LaVar, Jesse, and Brother Man. So, Will Charles brought Spiffy, LaVar, Jesse, and Brother Man? Yes. And is Brother Man the defendant? Yes. 
Was Mr. Span walking at the time? Yes. And did you see any of these individuals? Spiffy, Mr. Span, LeVar, or Jesse, carrying a firearm? Yes. Who did you see with a firearm? All of them. And were you, you or the other unknowns you were with, carrying a particular type of gun? I was carrying a MAC-10. And was that MAC-10 of particular interest to anyone that day? Yes. To who? To LeVar and Lil Charles. LeVar and Lil Charles? Yes. And what, if anything, did you do with a MAC-10? I allowed them to take it with them. And why did you do that? Because I really didn't want to ride with it anyway. I'm sorry? I didn't want to ride with it anyway. Did you ever get the MAC-10 back? No. Why not? Because during the time I was supposed to get it back from them, Charles ended up getting shot. I'm sorry, sir, could you say that again? The day I was supposed to get it back, Lil Charles got shot. And who was supposed to bring the gun back to you? Brother Man. And did Mr. Span bring the gun back to you? No. Did anyone ask if you wanted the gun back? No. And you never asked for it in return? No. And why didn't you ask for the gun back? Because they had some internal stuff going on with themselves, and I didn't want to be a part of that. And when you say they had some internal stuff going on with themselves, what do you mean? They came to the... to the light that is own. Charles's own little guys was the ones who supposedly shot him up. <coughs> and when you say, Charles, other little guys, do you mean other 44 corner hustlers? Yes. <laughs> The year is 1997, LeBar Bro Manspan, took Rio the Rat's Mac-10 machine gun, and started a gang war with older Four Corner Hustlers led by Charles Thornton, aka, Lil Charles, that wrecked havoc on the lives of many people, for many years to come. So, where was Gordon Thornton, aka, Gordy, and why wasn't he calling shots for the Gordy boys on the west side of Chicago? According to the Las Vegas Sun, in June 1997 it was reported that, two fugitives known for their ties to a notorious Chicago street gang have been arrested in Las Vegas. On Tuesday, U.S. Marshals, assisted by federal agents and Metro Police, arrested Gordon Thornton, 25, on murder and drug trafficking charges, and Morris Liddell Carr, 36, on drug trafficking charges. The two, were taken into custody without incident after agents Monday arrested an acquaintance, who, tipped them off to the whereabouts of the two fugitives. Police said Thornton and Carr, had been in Las Vegas on vacation. Thornton and Carr, were arrested at 5.30pm, Tuesday, in an apartment at 787 East Harmon Avenue, near Maryland Parkway. The investigation involved agents from the U.S. Marshal Service in Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin and Ohio, ATF, DEA, and FBI agents in Indiana and Illinois, and police from Indiana and Chicago. According to the U.S. Marshal Service, Carr is the alleged kingpin of a major cocaine and weapons trafficking organization, the Four Corners Street Hustlers, a splinter group of the Vice Lords in Chicago, with operations in California, Michigan, and Missouri. Carr was wanted on a charge of conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute cocaine, and using a firearm during drug trafficking, unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, and unlawful use of a weapon. Thornton, an associate of Carr and also an alleged member of the Four Corners gang, was wanted on charges of murder and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. So, Gordy, was on the run from a murder charge in 1997 when his little homie, LeVar Bro Manspan, took a shot at, the top spot. Before we discuss Gordy's murder charge in more detail, let me point out that he was arrested with, Morris Liddell Carr, also known as, Hodari Joe, the 5 star Universal, Chief, Elite of the Almighty Angela Maniac, 4 Corner Hustlers. It's time to look at the appeal of, the people of the state of Illinois versus the defendant, Christopher Allen, to find out why, Gordon Thornton, aka, Gordy, was wanted for murder in 1997. The charges against defendant, arose from events occurring in the summer of 1993. During that time, Yvette Malone, ran a drug operation wherein she and approximately 10 employees were involved in the sale of crack cocaine in the area near Madison Street and Menard Avenue in Chicago. She had been selling cocaine for approximately two years, but denied using drugs herself. 
Malone, testified at trial that one of her employees, Rosemary Lumpkin, was her cousin. Rosemary, bagged cocaine in preparation for sale at the nearby Grand Hotel. They used a room at the Grand Hotel to conduct business, package cocaine, store their money, and keep a handgun for protection. Malone, testified that she was not a member of a street gang. She knew, however, that the area in which she conducted her drug operation was turf for the Four Corner Hustlers street gang. Prior to the summer of 1993, Malone had no problems with the gang regarding her drug selling. However, during that summer, she learned that Gordon, known to her as Gordy, was trying to contact her. She did not know, who, Gordy was at that time. Malone testified that, near the end of July 1993, she and Rosemary were on the corner of Madison Street and Menard Avenue when several cars pulled up. A group of 20 to 30 people, exited the cars and proceeded to spread out across the street from the women. A man who introduced himself as, Gordon, approached her, along with defendant and another person, whom Gordon introduced as, Sink. Gordon told Malone that, he was a five-star elite, a position of rank in the four corner hustlers. He did not introduce defendant, or tell Malone what defendant's position was in the gang. Malone walked with Gordon, and Sink, who were standing side by side, while defendant stood about two feet behind them. Malone, testified that she was very nervous and continually looked back at defendant. Malone, had a good reason to be nervous. Darnell, Sink Bryant, was standing next to Gordy. Sink, was the five-star universal, chief, elite of the almighty black insane, four corner hustlers. Rosemary, began to walk with them, but was told she could not do so. She then remained at their original location. During the walk, Gordon told Malone that he was looking for her because she was working on that corner, and had to pay the nation, meaning the four corner hustlers street gang, $3,000, if she wanted to continue to work on that corner. Because Malone did not have the money readily available, and needed a few days to obtain it, Gordon, gave her a telephone number, and told her to contact him when she had the money. The 20 to 30 people, then got back into their cars and drove away. Malone, continued to sell cocaine on the corner of Menard and Madison. A few days later, she contacted Gordon by telephone, and set up a meeting at a nearby gas station. Malone, drove to the gas station with her cousin Rosemary. When they arrived, Gordon, defendant, and another individual were already there. Gordon, approached the women in their vehicle, while defendant remained standing by a telephone booth about five feet away. Malone gave Gordon $1,500. Gordon, instructed her to telephone him when she had the rest of the money. Although she learned from her employees over the following days that Gordon was trying to contact her. She did not call him regarding the additional money he had demanded because she did not have the funds. Malone, testified that around 7 p.m., on August 26, 1993, she went to the Maywood racetrack with her four-year-old son, and a man named Willie. Pause. I'm not a gangster, but if a bitch owed me money, and went to the racetrack instead of paying me, I might kill a bitch too. After leaving the racetrack around 11.30 p.m., Malone saw Rosemary and her cousin, Vanita Savage, near Madison Street and Menard Avenue. Malone and her son got out of the car, and, while she was conversing with Rosemary, Vanita, and some other men who worked for her, Gordon, and a man Malone identified as defendant, approached on a motorcycle. They stopped the motorcycle just two or three feet from Malone. Gordon, asked Malone who was selling drugs for her that night. Malone responded that, everyone out there was. Gordon said he would return, and rode away on the motorcycle, with Gordon driving, and defendant riding on the back. Malone testified that, when Gordon spoke, she watched him directly in the face because he scared her. Malone testified that, she then expected trouble. She, Rosemary, and Vanita went to the Grand Hotel to get her gun, and informed the next shift not to sell any drugs that night. When Malone left the hotel, she placed the gun under the passenger seat of the car. Malone testified that, after dropping her son off at a relative's house, she, Vanita, and Rosemary drove around looking for other people that worked for Malone, to warn them of the possible trouble. Vanita was driving, Malone was in the front passenger seat, and Rosemary was in the back seat. While they were driving down Waller Street, they saw Gordon driving his motorcycle ahead of them. Malone saw that a man she knew as, Glenn, was now riding on the back of Gordon's motorcycle. Gordon and Glenn, motioned for Vanita to pull around the motorcycle. Gordon and Glenn, then followed them as they drove down Waller Street. 
Malone testified they saw a police car at Waller and Madison. They debated stopping the car, but Malone decided not to stop because she knew she had a warrant out for her arrest, and she currently had a gun in the car. Instead, they turned right onto Madison. Gordon and Glenn did not follow them, but instead continued straight down Waller. Malone, Rosemary, and Vanita proceeded straight down Menard until they reached Washington. While they were stopped at a red light, Gordon's motorcycle drove up again on the right side of their car. Gordon was still driving the motorcycle, but now defendant was riding on the back. The motorcycle stopped near the front of the car, on the passenger side by where Malone was seated. Malone had a clear view of who was on the motorcycle. Although she did not know defendant's name at the time, she recognized him. Malone identified defendant in open court as the man riding on the back of Gordon's motorcycle. Malone then watched as Gordon said something to defendant which she could not hear. Defendant, who was about five feet from Malone, reached between his legs, removed a gun, and shot repeatedly into the car. Malone testified that the motorcycle had been stopped next to the car for about 40 seconds when defendant fired the gun and that while he fired the weapon, she was staring at Gordon and defendant, and they were staring at her. Malone was shot twice. The bullet struck her in the arm and entered her chest. Malone threw up her arms and yelled, I've been shot. I've been shot. Vanita yelled, I've been shot, too. Vanita had been struck repeatedly in the chest and died as a result of her injuries. So, Vanita Savage died because her drug dealing cousin, Yvette Malone, decided to go to the racetrack instead of paying a violent street gang $1,500. <laughs> In 1997, Demetrius Harris, aka, Michi, was known as, Lil Nitty, when he was a young four-corner hustler, and his uncle Frank Harris, better known in the neighborhood as, Frank Nitty, hung with bro man. Why did you associate with them? Because I had an uncle, he was a member of the four-corner hustlers, and I looked up to him, so I wanted to be like him, so I considered myself a four-corner hustler. What was your uncle's name? Frank, Frank Harris, aka, also known as, Frank Nitty. Was that his, nickname, Frank Nitty? Yes sir. Was this, the uncle, you mentioned a moment ago, who died? Yes. And was Frank Harris a four-corner hustler? Yes sir. Did Frank associate with a particular faction of the four-corner hustlers? Yes sir. Which one? The Gordy Fours. Who are the Gordy, four-corner hustlers? My uncle Frank, Ronald, Jesse, Labar, and Spiffy, a number of them. Demetrius Harris, testified that he met Bro Man in 1996 or 97, when he was just 13 or 14 years old. During this time, Bro Man, would come over Michi's mom's crib to kick it with her brother, Frank Mitty, and to bag up crack cocaine. When the Gordy Four started beefing with each other, Frank Mitty, chose to ride with Lil Charles against Bro Man. Frank Nitty, was murdered in January 1998. In 1999, Bro Man, was shot and paralyzed for life, when he attempted to rob a four-corner hustler loyal to Lil Charles named, Carlos Caldwell. In 2000, Sammy Booker, murdered Carlos Caldwell, and LeVar Smith for Bro Man. Remember, LeVar Smith, was one of the Gordy Boy Fours with Bro Man, serving as security for Lil Charles, when Bro Man got his hands on, Rio the Rat's Mac-10 machine gun, and started shooting members of his own gang. In 2003, Bro Man, was arrested for the murder of Latin King Chief, and homie to New York rappers DMX and Fat Joe, Rudy Wrangle Jr., aka, Kato. And according to DMX, this, is the story of when, Kato was ready to lean back, and let his Latin King homies put in the work to, an alive, DMX's rap rival, Ja Rule, when he came to Chicago. Rat, nigga. Wow. Nobody takes a flight 
and don't have a ride. You mean that niggas in flight? You have a ride with the airport? Car service. Car service? The boy. You, the boy. you have a ride? Yeah. Nobody hops on the Holiday Inn show bus. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, no, I ain't never been on that joint. The <laughs> Eels. <laughs> Romana show bus. Nobody got that. It's nobody. Oh, even the cab. Jump in the cab. Oh, I already said it. I come up smoke to the airport for the kill. Ten trucks. Pow. Old man king. Pow. And, and, and who was it on the old? Well, they did what they did. You know how it is. Wow. They did what they did. But I was, you know what I'm saying? I come out to the kill like, yo, yo, no, yo. No. I know I didn't just see what I think I saw. I'm like, yeah, it would have been on my conscience. I, you know, I, I can see nigga popping his other. You earned that one, nigga. You, 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 you paid for that. that oh. You paid for that. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. That, that's what that way. Fuck you. Suck my dick. You put that way. All that, all that, all that. You mean? Yeah. That's gay right there. Nigga say, yo, what's up? You gonna leave the airport? Dead serious. Wow. Look, 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 look. I made up on the internet. Rudy Rangel. AKA Kale. Whoa. Say, nigga, him alone was responsible for these 2,000 deaths in Chicago. Damn. You mean? Yeah. Rest in peace. Yeah. In jail, bro man, started another war. According to an article in the Chicago Sun-Times, published after bro man's arrest in 2015, and federal RICO charges were brought, the reputed Four Corner Hustlers leader, was found to have been involved in jailhouse threats, violence and other infractions an average of about once every two months between late 2003, and mid-2007 while being held on a murder charge. So, bro man, kept up the tradition of four corner hustler leaders going to war with the police, after his arrest for killing Kato. Squad to my dog, Kato. This is Big Freddy. While locked up at the Cook County Jail, reputed West Side gang leader, Labar Bro Man Span, wanted everyone, jail guards, other inmates, the medical staff, even janitors, to know just how much power he wielded. I run this shit, Span, who's now facing new, Federal charges that accuse him of taking part in six killings, told another inmate in 2005, according to records obtained by the Chicago Sun-Times. No matter where you go on this compound, I'll have your shit split. Span, didn't deny wrongdoing in 14 of the cases, including the one in which he was accused of bragging about numerous unsolved murders committed by his gang, and telling a corrections officer, you're going to be next. Yet, he wasn't punished after being accused of making that threat, jail records show. The board, which has the authority to impose punishments as severe as restrictive custody, in which a detainee's jailhouse privileges are restricted, found Span guilty as charged, in only three cases. For those, he was ordered to spend a total of 58 days in restrictive custody during the three and a half year period he spent at the Cook County Jail. He also was ordered to undergo psychological evaluations, following five of the incidents. And he got a single, verbal reprimand. In March 2004, records show Span told a corrections officer, your kids and your family, are going to die, motherfucker, and then I'm going to kill your bitch. I'm gonna fuck you up right now, I'm gonna shank you the first chance I get. In that case, the disciplinary board didn't punish Span, but ordered him to undergo a psychological evaluation, records show. Ten months later, Span, was accused of refusing to go back to his cell. When officers tried to take him there, he attacked one of them, according to a disciplinary report. Span started to use his wheelchair as a weapon, and attacked an officer by rolling his wheelchair back onto the officer's feet and legs multiple times. According to an article published on June 1, 2005, in the Forest Park Review, We Always Targets, no matter what, reputed new breed gang leader Anthony Psycho Johnson is quoted as telling Forest Park resident, Ray Longstreet, recently in a wiretapped phone conversation. Early last Wednesday morning, Johnson was proved right, as some 20 Chicago police and federal agents surrounded the brick bungalow in the 1000 block of Circle Avenue, where Longstreet was living and arrested the reputed leader of the Four Corner Hustlers Street Gang. Longstreet, 40, has been living under home confinement since his parole from Stateville Correctional Center on May 12, 2004. During that time, police say, he headed a sprawling street corner drug operation on the west side of Chicago that grossed as much as $50,000 a day. Longstreet, who was paroled on a 1995 firearms conviction, and for attacking a correctional officer while in prison, was restricted to home confinement since his release, and was wearing an electronic monitor. According to his parole agreement, however, he was allowed to leave his home from 5 to 10 p.m. on Saturdays for recreation. That, 
said authorities, is when he conducted business related to what they say was a 36-block drug empire in the Austin neighborhood. According to a 126-page affidavit filed in support of the arrests, police contend that Longstreet personally oversaw drug sales at Division and Keeler Avenues in North Austin, and Hamlin Avenue and Iowa Street in the West Garfield Park neighborhood. Ray Longstreet's lieutenant, and bro man's main op, Charles Thornton, aka, Lil Charles, was arrested with, Ray Ray, in an investigation that authorities named, Operation Street Sweeper. For their part, scores of local and federal law enforcement officers, were also involved in investigating bro man over the years, including two who would ultimately be sent to federal prison for their own crimes. Police records show that former CPD officer, Jerome Finnegan, was involved in Span's first murder case in 1996. Span, then a member of the Gordy's faction of the Four Corner Hustlers, allegedly punched a woman in the face, triggering a conflict with members of a nearby faction of unknown vice lords. One of those vice lords, was related to the woman who Span punched. Leaders of both gang factions called a meeting to clear the air, but no resolution came, according to police records. Span, and two other Four Corner Hustlers, then walked to the corner of Lexington and Springfield to wait for the vice lords, who were headed east back to their territory. When their car passed by, Span and the others opened fire, according to police records. None of the vice lords were shot, but the driver lost control of the car, and ran over a 31-year-old city subcontractor, Wayne Lucas, who was laying fresh asphalt nearby. Lucas, a father of five, was taken to Mount Sinai Hospital, and pronounced dead 12 hours later. Span, was eventually found not guilty, but his co-defendants were both convicted and sentenced to several decades in prison. In 2009, Bro Man, was released from jail to the streets of Chicago, on the same genocidal path he was on, when he was found not guilty of the murder of Cato, and yet again, his co-defendants faced consequences as they were convicted, and sentenced to decades in prison. Jerome Finnegan, was the ringleader of a rogue band of CPD officers, who stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from drug dealers, and civilians alike. In 2011, he was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison after he pleaded guilty to a murder for hire plot and tax evasion. His and Span's paths would cross again, a few years after Lucas' death. One of Span's younger half-brothers, Michael, was arrested in the 600 block of North Avers, a block where, at one point, Span allegedly kept a stash house. After the arrest, Finnegan and another former CPD officer, Timothy McDermott, were photographed holding hunting rifles over Michael Span, who was lying on the floor with deer antlers on his head and his tongue hanging out of his mouth. The Chicago Sun-Times obtained and published the photo in 2015. Since 2015, Bro Man, has been locked up, and there are no public reports of him assaulting correctional officers, since his most recent incarceration. Bro Man, was arrested on weapons charges in 2015, after his dumbass posted a video of himself at a gun range to social media, when he was a convicted felon, legally prohibited from firing a gun. Racist piece of shit cop, Jerome Finnegan, went to jail for conspiring to kill another officer, who, he thought might snitch on him. His plot was captured on a wiretap by his lil homie, Officer Keith Herrera, a corrupt cop turned informant by the feds. Keith Herrera, dated Viviana Lopez in high school. Viviana Lopez, is married to Pedro Flores. Pedro Flores's twin brother, Margarito Jr., or Jay, married Cato's widow, Valerie Guyton, shortly after Cato was murdered. Viviana Lopez's sister, Bianca Finnegan, is married to Jerome Finnegan's brother. Eventually, the Flores twin's older brother Armando, Valerie Guyton, Viviana Lopez, and Bianca Finnegan would all go to prison for laundering millions of dollars of the twins' drug money. Former CPD Sergeant Xavier Elizondo, was sentenced to nearly six years in federal prison in 2020, after he and another officer were convicted of cooking up bogus search warrants as a way to rob criminal suspects. He was also heavily involved in investigating Span. Between late 2012 and early 2013, Elisondo submitted four affidavits that were used to acquire wiretaps on several of Span's phones. In the first affidavit, Elisondo referenced other investigations into Span that were unsuccessful. In May 2003, Operation 5K was initiated by members of the Chicago Police Department, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Elisondo wrote. The operation focused on Span, and the Four Corner Hustlers, and their possible involvement in 16 homicides. Elisondo noted that, it was difficult to convince informants to testify against Span in open court. 
Several cooperating individuals have provided information as part of this investigation, but they are not willing to testify against Span because of fear of retaliation, he wrote. Eli Sondo was criminally charged in 2018, as the case against Span and his co defendants was moving forward, placing federal prosecutors in the uncomfortable position of simultaneously prosecuting Eli Sondo for lying in one case, while defending the veracity of his statements in another. Now, one of the Fed's most significant street gang convictions in recent years could be on shaky ground, after prosecutors made a disclosure a judge called extraordinary, before he suggested a jury's verdict could be tossed out. Labar Broman Span was convicted by a jury of racketeering charges in 2021, and is facing a mandatory life sentence, but prosecutors failed to fully disclose the details of the plea agreement reached with Sammy Booker, the man who killed the man that paralyzed Bro Man in 1999. So, there is a possibility that one day, bro man, might be a, free man. Please, smash that like button and subscribe, if you've enjoyed our show, and want to help us reach 5,000 subscribers. That is crazy, man. Let's go like boss. Me, M, Kill, and my nigga PC. We all got to take it at the same time. Dang. Like, yo, I just met today, though, we can't... Nobody introduced us. Who is no dick bash, yo? This is the headline game, give us up. This is the MX... We just work in the same studio, the same studio, okay, you see me? That's good. So, like, we see the guy daily coming. Yeah, we're not just keeping it.